Hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. We would like to thank you for joining us. Good morning, good evening. We would like to thank you for joining us for the 25th edition of the Annual Investment Meeting Webinar Series and first edition for the Latin America chapter. Today, we're presenting challenges for agribusiness in Latin America and the vision from investors in the Middle East. My name is Astrid Chedid, Regional Director for Latin America, the Caribbean and Spain, and I'll be your MC for today. The annual investment meeting is the largest investment platform in the world. An initiative from the UAE Ministry of Economy, AIM has been boosting a global linkage by connecting investment opportunities for companies and governments all over the world under six key pillars, foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment, small and medium enterprises, startups, and future cities, with special events on One Belt, One Road. Let me just mention too that the annual investment meeting has developed a new disruptive strategy in order to help reactivate the agribusiness sector, giving a boost to international trade in Latin America, the Caribbean, and Spain. It is called the Agribusiness Virtual Trade Mission. It is an initiative where companies will receive 30 hours of training and get the opportunity to present their products in front of buyers from the Gulf countries in virtual B2B meetings. We are currently receiving applications until July 31st, 2020. Please visit the website www.mcongress.com slash VTM for more information. And now just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. If you experience any issues with your audio or video during the webinar, just refresh your browser and that should take care of everything. We would also suggest using Chrome Firefox or Opera. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in the control panel on the right side of your screen. If you like to make a specific question, vote for it under the questions tab so we can address it to our speakers. Right now, we're running live polls located beside the question tab too. We request, we request you to participate by, by casting your votes. In today's webinar, our speakers will have a crucial discussion on the evolution of agribusiness in Latin America, the development of the industry, and the potential opportunities investors from the Middle East see in the area, the projects that are taking place, and how to develop a stronger bridge between these important regions, Latin America and the GCC countries. I would now like to introduce you to the moderator for today's webinar. Mr. Abdallah, who is the Managing Director of BMG Consultants Office in the UAE. Based in Latin America for the last decade, having worked for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the United Arab Emirates, he's experienced in international agreements, governmental relations, and new frontier engagements. He has also developed new strategies of investments and trade between the two regions, organizing or participating in all major government and private sector delegations. He will be joined by a panel of experts. Without further ado, we will turn time over to our wonderful speakers. Abdallah, please come on stage. It looks like we're having some technical issues. Our team is working on it. Meanwhile, let's keep our conversation going and feel free to ask any questions in the control panel. We'll be waiting until Mr. Abdallah can come back and we will try to fix the issues. Just give us a few minutes, please. Can you hear me? Yes, you're back. Thank yeah. you. I'm sorry. Uh, so I would just, yeah, thank you very much. 
So um, uh, very quickly, I would just like to say the two themes that we're going to discuss today. Um, first of all, salam alaikum, uh, buenos dias or bon dia, I don't know the time frame you're in. Uh, with the two themes that we're going to discuss today, uh, one is food security as a national policy in our region. Um, and this is in regard to um, supplying our people with the commodities uh, we need to survive. And this kind of investment uh, doesn't concentrate on, on ROI or return of investment. And the second uh, theme is, of course, uh, investments in agriculture that, of course, uh, bring us a high yield in, in return of investment. And secondary, uh, kind of a sub a subgroup of these two themes will be uh, discussions on trade and, of course, on investment, because trade is also a big issue. Um, as uh, Astrid mentioned, I'm, uh, and uh, I've been working in Latin America for the last uh, ten, uh, over 10 years in international agreements. And one other thing just to mention very quickly is Latin America uh, has a lot of uh, in, in very specific and interesting and crucial agreements like the double taxation agreement, bilateral investment treatment, uh, treaty, sorry, and of course in Brazil, the ACFI. So um, I would just like to first, before we begin uh, with the questions, I would like to just first introduce uh, my diverse uh, panelists here. Um, I, of course, I'm going to be biased because I'm from this region, from the Arab world. I'm going to introduce, of course, first uh, our colleague who's working out of, the, of, out of Saudi Arabia. His name uh, might trick you. His name is William Henry England, but he's more Arab than I am. He's worked in more than, uh, I, I believe, eight countries. He has a very, very good experience with massive agricultural projects in Azerbaijan and in Russia and in Europe. And uh, his expertise is really uh, crucial for the region in acquiring uh, businesses and agriculture investment to bring back to the region. Uh, the second panelist we have today is from uh, Mexico. Uh, Jorge Narvaez, I, I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Um, basically, our colleague from Mexico is, uh, is a, let's say, a bureaucrat, a government employee with expertise. He was the Ag Undersecretary of Agriculture, Livestock, Rural Development and Fisheries and Food. Uh, today, he, uh, he's an expert in uh, the agri-food sector and consultant in development. Um, he's working for the National Agricultural Council. Uh, my next uh, colleague is from Colombia, uh, Jorge Bedoya, uh, a career, I think, government employee. He's also, which is very interesting, has worked for the defense sector, which also helps us because food security also ties into our national security and defense. It's, it's two things that are linked together. So he can maybe give us uh, more information on how uh, investment in agriculture is also linked to government initiatives in, in defense and, and in security. Our last colleague is from Brazil, who has a vast experience um, through, through Vision uh, Brazil Investments, has a vast experience of obtaining foreign direct investment, uh, specifically in agriculture. Uh, I'll let him, I will allow him to talk later about a very good uh, success story with the Canadian uh, Pension Fund um, allowing uh, sustainability, they've even won prizes in the way they've allocated these investments in agriculture, but concentrating on sustainability. So I will allow my panelists to talk. Again, we really feel that uh, we would like more uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we feel that the curiosity of the audience is more important than us because uh, believe, believe me, if I allow myself and my panelists to talk, We'll go on forever. We love to talk. So um, basically, I will ask a question to each panelist, uh, one question each. Uh, they will have five minutes to answer, and then we'll give the floor to the audience to ask questions. If everyone agrees with me, I would like to start, of course, again, being biased. I would like to start with my colleague from Saudi Arabia. Um, so uh, I would like to ask you, uh, there are many issues related to agribusiness, being food security one of the most important. The challenge is to sustainability, to improve agricultural product, productivity, to increasing demand. 
I, I would like to ask you, what do you think can be an effective uh, tools to tackle this challenge? And of course, uh, please mention that the, the, let's say the challenge is that the image of, of another country coming into X country and acquiring land using that production to, to sustain their, 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 another region. If you, if you can please elaborate. So uh, thanks, Abdul Rahman, and thank you for the for the great introduction. Um, I, I think I would describe my introduction as, as slightly different. I'm a farmer, okay. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, farming is an industry that's been with us for tens of thousands of years. And I think all of us would would understand the the repeated use of words like sustainability. Um, and, and making sure that we're respectful to the environment, um, and, and that we've got that we've got you know a long term a long term opportunity to work together. And, and the other thing is that the world is a very complex ecosystem. So here we seventy percent of our food. Uh, we do not have the ability in the kingdom to produce enough food of all of the range of food that we wish but everybody everything in life has positives and negatives so we do have the opportunity we have the buying power to support without question the food security of our population of our hugely important citizens and therefore we use that buying power by going out into the world and looking for opportunities for food security now clearly let's not take away from the fact that Whilst I work for a food security organization, which is 100% government owned, it is, the, it is the commercial world that deals with food security, providing the food on a day-to-day -day basis. Our purpose is in times of need, or our purpose is in building bridges, building opportunities, and building future potential uh, transactions. So given, given that we are, always going to be a food importer in the kingdom it is absolutely fundamentally important that we build long-term honest straight sustainable deals with countries that themselves will always be exporters we've all seen the fringes of criticism of global agribusiness investment about moving water etc etc the world trades Osmosis is the process of the flow of too much to too little. So this is why Latin America for us is a very interesting destination because countries like Brazil, like Argentina, these are naturally always going to be exporters to a country that will always be an importer. So our job at SALIC is to build long-term sustainable trading and investment relationships with the global net exporters. That's it. Very simple. You had you have three more minutes, but I, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's go to the questions because I think that that that's all what we're about. At the end of the day, Abdul Rahman, it's very yeah. very simple. If I if I just if I if I develop it a little bit further, mm. we're not interested in watermelons from from Japan. With respect to the global watermelon business and with respect to the Japanese, it was simply an example. Food security is about providing a nation with the basics of food and the basics of diet. So Salik does not get involved in beautiful salads. Salik gets involved in making sure that we have grains, we have oil seeds, we have rice, we have red meat, we have fish, we have forage, and we have dairy, particularly dairy powder. So it is the basics, the staples. And these are the large, the large quantities. So it's millions of tons of barley, millions of tons of wheat. You know, the country consumes 1.2 million tons of rice. So we are about making sure that the, the, the citizens of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia get the right amount of food in a time of need at the right price and that the food is safe. What this allows us to do is to be very bespoke and very surgical about what we do so again referring back to the watermelons from japan i'm sure they're an amazing opportunity for other investors to profit from such activities 
But we are very clear when we get opportunities coming into our business about what it is that we're looking for. Um, of course, food security should be profitable, but profit is not the ultimate driver. So we have a different type of investment logic, for example, to the private equities that are turning businesses over very quickly. We are often described as an evergreen investor. So we would be looking to invest and never exit, building a very long-term relationship. Is that about the three minutes? No, that's good. That's good. You got 30 seconds left, but I'll take your 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think it's very clear to everyone um, uh, in regards to food security, the commodities that we're talking about that will sustain our people. Thank you very much for that. And, and going from policy, government policy, to the private sector, I'll give the floor to Amaury. And my question to uh, Amaury from Brazil, from Vision Investments, um, my question to you really is, I know that in Brazil, the legislation states that foreigners cannot be the owners of land for agriculture production. So what is the solution for, uh, for in foreign investors that want to invest in agriculture? How, how do you provide these solutions to your foreign uh, investors in agriculture? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's relatively simple. Uh, as you think as a sort of analogy with real estate, land is like a plot where you build your building. And uh, when we have business of agriculture, there is typically a land operation and there is typically a, a not co, a land co and a not co. And uh, when you have a partnership with a foreign uh, entity, even though you may have restrictions in terms of land uh, uh, possession, uh, the, the building itself, which is the opco, exists. So we have uh, over years, over the years, uh, despite any issue of land ownership, been able to develop a very strong relationship with foreign investors. Uh, we have from many, have many different types of uh, sort of like jurisdictions, foreign investors in Brazil doing agriculture. Uh, in particular, for instance, one example that we have, we have developed a very strong relationship with a Canadian pension firm. And we went through a whole process of developing a farm in a very remote region of Brazil, like a 30,000 hectare farm, out of which we nowadays produce more than 17,000 hectares of uh, grains. Uh, and this is exactly that concept structure, because uh, there is ownership uh, on the rental and there is ownership on the opco. And of course, from a perspective of cooperation, the most important thing for a foreign investor coming to a country is not taking the land out of the country, but it's taking the commodity out of the country and taking the product out of the country. So the opco is much more important from ownership standpoint than the land code per se. But uh, of course, in any partnership, you have to have a percentage of uh, both entities. Mm -hmm. That was very quick. Thank you very much, uh, Amaury. I'll give the floor to my Mexican uh, colleague. Um, I would like to ask you, why are we not receiving from your, from your sector, from your country in Mexico? Why have we not receiving your beautiful production? Is uh, the historic relationship we have with Brazil, the, uh, we don't have, in, in our region I'm talking about, we don't have it with Mexico. We don't have a lot of investment in Mexico in terms of agriculture. Can you please tell us why this is? Is it ignorance or is it lack of uh, kind of publicity or lack of the relationship? Can we, can we understand um, why we're not investing or trading a lot with Mexico? Thank you, Mr. Thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure to share the stage for uh, with all, all this, my, my, with my colleagues. And let, let me explain about Mexico in the, in the agribusiness sector. So, uh, Mexico uh, is uh, the 11th largest food producer globally and the 10th world food exporter. So, in this position. Uh, of Mexico in the agribusiness sector is, is so huge. And uh, the agriculture food could have increased by almost 45% in the last few years. And as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Abdallah, why for is export not product in the Middle East is because the, 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 open, the open market and, and the open regularity uh, were for the last five years. So we need to increase 
the export, to promote exports from Mexico to the Middle East, and uh, basically in products as avocados, fruits and vegetables, dairy and uh, beef and pork meat is uh, the, the, the strongest product for export in Mexico. We have high quality, uh, high standards of uh, certifications. We export that product. We produce 80% of the exporters is to the United States. So we have high quality to export in Middle East. And also a lot of uh, more than 16 of the gross domestic products uh, of the primary se sector in the last six years show its uh, dynamism in the, Mexima, the Mexican countryside is full of opportunities. And you mentioned the food security, the agreement and the opportunities that we have to export. So we are in the in, in a real world that we need to increase the promotion of uh, uh, agriculture sector uh, to export. In this, in, this, uh, in this case, we have drivers and trends and challenges and all policy responses that we have to, 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 to accommodate in this, in this side. So we need to turn the bridges between both countries, uh, basically from Latin America to Middle East, uh, in terms of long term, as William said, trust, trade, uh, uh, and sustainability, uh, and sustainable as well. So the food security is a food availability and sanitary protocols that we need to, to, to increase. The supply chains uh, have supply shocks. So we, we, we need to, to, to moderate that uh, supply chains and increase the expectation and the promoting. We have a, a clearly production in Mexico and the investment opportunity for, for Mexico is to invest in infrastructure and facilities to export uh, in the different regions from Mexico. So uh, we need to, to, to build a service platform and a set of uh, dedicated tools as, uh, uh, for example, you, you have in the Middle East the uh, agroparks that they promote and, and provide the, the enough food for all the regions. So that is a, the big opportunity to invest in, in, in Mexico, to increase the production and to increase the infrastructure to export uh, to around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask my Colombian counterparts, um, I've I worked in Colombia and I visited many farms and many investment opportunities. My question to uh, my Colombian counterpart is with the advancement of technologies, uh, AI, drones, uh, in these rural parts of Colombia or even in the big industries of Colombia, how do you feel this integration of technology will help attract foreign investors? Well, Adala, salam alaikum, and, and thank you for having me here. That's a very important question. And I see Colombia as a land of opportunities for foreign direct investment, not only in the case of the agricultural sector, but also in the case of technology for the agricultural sector. This country has 40 million hectares of total potential for agricultural production, and we are using 7 million. So there's a great opportunity for partners like yourself, and we are also engaging in the exports to the Arab world. Uh, we are not uh, yet at the position of Brazil, Argentina, even Peru and Mexico, but that's a great potential. And in technology, that's a way to increase productivity. That's a way to engage in the efforts of bringing artificial intelligence, internet of things to the agricultural sector. And needless to say, the World Economic Forum has in Colombia one of the fourth industrial revolution centers, which is located in Medellin. Actually, we're working with the WEF in trying to have an innovation hub for the agricultural sector in Colombia. So it's a win-win. It's a win-win for bringing the investment of the technology, the platforms to make now in the COVID uh, worldwide scenario, 
closer our consumer to our producers, but also the investors. The Arab world has invested in Colombia in the mining industry, some little cases in terms of the agricultural community, and our ambassador in the UAE, which is concurrent to some other countries, and the great staff that the Colombian government agencies have are working very tight with the private sector in fostering the exports of our products to the Arab world, but also the attention of the investors to Colombia. One of the things or the key issues that I would like to state in, in this scenario is the possibility of having uh, the Arab world airlines coming to Colombia. We are working closely with the United Arab Emirates Embassy in this country to bring Etihad or, 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 or all the airlines to Colombia, uh, but that might help in shipping our products, our avocados, shipping our flowers, and most of the products, our cacao, one of the best cacaos in the world to the Arab world. So I think there are plenty of opportunities for technology, for investors in this country, for the potential that we have in terms of the land in the resources. We have investors coming from the US, coming from Mexico, from Peru, to increase the avocado production, the avocado has production in Colombia. And we just need to get closer to your markets. Uh, thank you very much. Just before I give the floor to the audience, I have some very interesting questions from the audience. I would like to ask my Latin American counterparts um, something that uh, I think our region needs to understand. Uh, for example, I give in Brazil, the majority of government entities concentrate on the exportation of agri-production into our region. And there is no, if I'm talking about specifically Brazil, there is no really a government agency that really is built to attract foreign direct investment in agriculture. I would like to ask my um, uh, Latin American colleagues to explain to me how the government itself uh, facilitates these kind of uh, investments. One and two, what are the, if not, if they don't exist, how do we go through the private sector? If I can ask that question, I'll begin with Amaury and then we'll go Mexico and Colombia, if possible. And Mauri and everyone, you have two minutes because I really want to give the floor to the audience. You have two sure, minutes. Sure. Each. Okay, no, no, that's a good question. I think that uh, a bit on the history side, I think, for instance, when we started uh, sort of doing uh, agriculture in terms of investments, this was around 2005, so about 15 years ago. At that point in time, there was very little support or say infrastructure for, I would say, attracting foreign investments into Brazil. Uh, initially, we were able to uh, gather a lot of interest from foreign investors into the cattle uh, sector, uh, cattle growing sector. Uh, up, up, up to a point in time, we managed close to 600,000 heads of cattle uh, on behalf of foreign investors, like as an investment opportunity. Uh, and we had a large portfolio of uh, agricultural sort of like uh, financing uh, schemes for like uh, row crops, for uh, sort of like uh, uh, different segments, uh, sugar cane, etc. segments in Brazil. Uh, over time, uh, as things evolved, I think we see that uh, the private sector, uh, in particular for the case of Brazil, has been the sort of like the engine for the growth of agriculture export. Brazil nowadays is third largest exporter in the world. And what I see is that uh, primarily this has been the work of the private sector in regards to make this happen. Um, uh, we have uh, seen like, of course, in the sort of like the last few years, the presence of agencies such as Apex is an agency that the government put in place to help uh, the trade. So it's more focused on trade, uh, bilateral trade, uh, sort of like uh, agreements and bilateral trade, uh, sort of like enhancements. Um, but over time, I think that there's not specifically an entity that uh, cares for foreign direct investments. Uh, and Brazil has attracted a lot of foreign direct investments, uh, in particular uh, private equity, in corporate investments, etc. Uh, but that has been uh, basically on a risk basis, uh, meaning uh, people just believing on the investment opportunities that they are there. Uh, in that regard, what I would say, for instance, uh, uh, in our particular case, we've done a lot of finance for agriculture, and nowadays we manage uh, in excess of 200,000 200, hectares of agricultural land that we do in partnership with foreign investors in Brazil. And uh, we have exit more than 100,000 hectares of lands we have developed, particularly in row crops, uh, uh, soy, cotton, and 
core. So I think that the uh, opportunity set continues to be very strong and the payouts are also very, very attractive. So uh, uh, when you look at sort of like a risk return profile, um, different, let's say, when you talk about agricultural land, agricultural land, you think almost like a real estate, but it's not a static real estate. Real estate, uh, typically you have depreciation over time. Agricultural land, you have appreciation over time. So it's an asset basis that over time is a real asset that has a component of appreciation and a very strong cash flow yield if you properly take care of the land. So in that regard, sustainability is a very important component for us. And we have had, uh, in, in, when we partner with like some of the foreign uh, uh, investors, we have aimed a lot into sustainable. Uh, we won even a prize in 2015 uh, for sustainability, a major national prize for sustainability in, in a remote region of Brazil developing like sustainable farms in large scale. Uh, so I think that uh, that's the essence. I think that, of course, uh, uh, my colleagues, I think that they have, they represent some government agencies. Uh, uh, I think that in Brazil, what I think is the most important agency that I would say for agriculture is Embrapa. Embrapa was created to develop technology and has been the leading technology developer for agriculture in tropics, uh, has exported that technology to Africa, to many different countries. And I think that, ha that has been basically the engine of growth of agriculture in Brazil. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Amaury. I'll hand it over to our Mexican colleague. If you can please explain the same. How has the government uh, helped in attracting or has not helped in attracting uh, foreign investment in agriculture? Yes, thank you. Uh, as we know, the, the, go the, the government is a facilitator and promoter of the agribusiness activity. Uh, in that case, Mexico is one of the most open and we have more than 60 agreements with um, uh, some of the most important countries in the world. And also we, we have phones and the Mexican Development Bank is uh, so important in this case. But we have to, to be clear, that the government had some things and some activities. In the private sector, we have to link between the government and we need to ask and we need to, to, to promote and to push the policies in the design of policies between the private and public sector to trading better. In, in this case, uh, from CNA, the National Agricultural Council, as we participate as a private sector, is a national civil association and it is a representative body of the private agri food sector. And the CNA represents the 75% of the agri food GDP and the 80% of the agri-food exporters. So we have to link and we have to, to, to run together, government and private sector, to, to, to see the needs and the, and, the, and the facilities that we need to promote the exporters uh, from Mexico. Sir, sir to cut you off, uh, my brother, the question was, uh, how does the government uh, facilitate investment in Mexico, not the exportation uh, for Mexican production. That, yes. that way, I think that's the main the question we have. Yes, that, that is on one side. We, we promote together the, 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 the exports from Mexico. And also, yeah. government prove and promote the investment through the uh, National Mexican Development Bank and also some funds specifically for the, for the agri-food sector. So, we have the capacity to get investment from other countries. We, we have already from the United States, from Europe, from Asia, and Mexico is so attractive for everyone because we have the, the largest market uh, in the world on the north. We export to Europe, uh, uh, which is the, uh, a huge and big market, and the Asian market is opening in, in, in this case. And, and the Middle East could be uh, a good opportunity to invest in Mexico in the production, in the land, and also in the infrastructure. We need to, to improve the infrastructure to, to, to export. And it's a huge opportunity for everyone and the investors to, to see around and to get more infrastructure uh, facilities and also services. The play of the game at the, at the moment is the technology 
as Jorge Bedoya said, and also the logistics. That are the, 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 the both main things that we have to invest and to uh, and, and, uh, and get the set of in that investments. Uh, thank you very much. I'll pass it on to our Colombian counterpart. Thank you. Well, the government has done many things uh, in an alliance with the private sector. First, the seriousness of how we handle the Colombian economy. Our monetary policy, our fiscal policy has been very serious throughout the year. So there's a certainty about how the policy handles the economy and how the central bank and the minister of finance will behave in the years to come. Second, the Colombian government has made stronger the institutions for attracting foreign direct investment. Pro Colombia, which is the uh, institution from the Colombian government that brings the investment to this country, has done a wonderful job under the leadership of Flavia Santoro, who is the woman leading this uh, uh, institution. Third, opening embassies in the Arab world, but also bringing the attention of the Arab countries to have their own embassies in Colombia. Recently, and when I was Deputy Minister of Defense, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, with the Colombian embassy recently opened in that country of security issues. But needless to say, we have very things that we share with the Arab world. Third, we have created a business-oriented environment in Colombia. The government, with the support of the Colombian Congress, has created different laws that provide for foreign direct investors and for Colombian investors a clear understanding of the rules, the long-term rules for making sure that your investments are going to be here without hesitation. And finally, something that is natural to this country, natural resources. In the case of the agribusiness, as I said before, we have 40 million hectares for total potential of agricultural production. But that comes in hand with the availability of water, with the availability of uh, rule of law in terms of the private property in this country. And of course, the advantage that we have to coast to the Pacific and to the Atlantic Ocean, and we are in a revolution of creating more infrastructure with public resources. So I said, Colombia has a, not the perfect probably, but a wonderful environment for bringing investors from uh, any part of the world. I, I end with this. In the last uh, quarter of 2019, before COVID came into this world, foreign direct investment in the agricultural sector was growing double digit. We have investors from the US, Cargill Company, for example. We have investors in Has Avocado from Mexico, from Peru, from Chile. We have people coming from the US to harvest blueberries in this country. And we have many people, of course, buying the Colombian coffee, which is the best coffee in the world. So that I would say uh, to your question. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to my Latin American colleagues. I think they've made it very clear that this webinar is called Challenges for Agribusiness in Latin America, but it should be called Ignorance in Investment in Latin, in Latin America, because it's very clear to me from your answers that it's very easy uh, to invest in Latin America. I think um, the relationship between the two countries in many aspects in regards to investment needs to grow. And maybe uh, my Mexican colleague uh, mentioned the promotion. Uh, we need to really focus on that because it, I've been there for, for, as I said, over 10 years and I've seen the potential. And I think maybe we really need to work on uh, the promotion more. Another aspect you mentioned is uh, the logistics side. The logistics side, I think everyone knows in the United Arab Emirates, we have the Ports World, we have Emirates Airlines, my Colombian uh, counterpart mentioned the Tahad Airways. Uh, we have a lot of logistics support. And what's the beautiful thing, and I'm gonna in, in a second pass it to my colleague from Saudi Arabia, the beautiful thing about investment in food security and uh, agriculture is once we do this, all of our logistic companies come in, all of our other uh, food sector companies come in to support that investment. We have a lot of questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to ask the first question to my Saudi Arabian counterpart because I think this is uh, well suited for him. He's had experience in this. The first question I have for you 
is what are, so I'm reading directly from, from our audience, from uh, Mrs. Fatma Al Fahim. What are some of the key challenges for building sustainable food security relations and agricultural trade between the GCC and Latin America? Question mark. And what are some potential solutions in your opinion? Um, I, I don't think there's any, as they say, rocket science in this. We are very different cultures. We are a long way away. Um, there is a there is often a painful learning process. Um, I, I would say, which I hope is um, appealing to the to the audience, that Latin America is very much on our target. We we definitely don't want to be investing everywhere in the world. So. You know, once you've made that anchor investment, then when you beget, when you become familiar with the legal framework, the accounting framework, but, but let's be honest, when you become familiar with the culture and the style of operation, then that makes every subsequent acquisition so much simpler. And, and I think that Abdul Rahman indicated earlier that, you know, we feel as, as a company that very often we provide the bridge um, there is often an element of bilateral support um, that um, whilst ever our investments would be of a commercial nature, that we would be going into a country with the knowledge of both governments, um, with the knowledge that this is a strategic relationship. And I think that gives comfort for a number of other organisations to follow to drive over that bridge uh, and to follow. Um, I, I think an investment, substantial investment from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia into Brazil doesn't go unnoticed, for example. Um, and the same would be the case with an investment into countries like Mexico, Colombia, and, and, and wherever. So I think that the, the challenges we face are, if you like, all of the above. Um, but the biggest challenge is just familiarity with the operating environment of a totally different culture. Um, and and the, 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 the way to, to, to mitigate that is, as I described earlier, we don't tend to invest everywhere around the world. We tend to be focused in, in, in areas and we would build. Um, so we may have um, a production agriculture investment and we would use that as a springboard to further originations, further vertically integrated development, either upstream or downstream. Um, so I, I think that's probably the first response to that excellent question. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that answer. We have uh, a lot of similar questions um, coming to me, but one question I have uh, specifically for our colleague from uh, Colombia, it's actually specifically for you, is uh, how can we think about investments uh, and agribusiness um, in regards to the foreign policy, um, how, how is the promotion um, being, you know, taken by the Colombian government in regards to the, the GCC countries, how is that relationship uh, being built? Well, frankly speaking, uh, and I read the question, it's pretty much new. We hadn't had in the past a very strong relationship with the GCC. Uh, and, and I remember back in 2013, when I was Vice Minister of Defense, our relationship was, was basically based on security issues. At that year, or at that time, we just opened our embassy in the UAE, which is concurrent to some other uh, countries in the GCC. So it's a pretty young relationship, uh, but I, I, I think not only the government of President Duque, but the previous government from President Santos, they were very eager to support a policy toward the, the GCC, and, and that's what we're doing now. Uh, some of the, the GCC countries have opened recently embassies in Colombia. Before COVID, we had uh, many trade missions coming to this country looking for investors, probably not in the agribusiness sector, but in other sectors. But I think that some of them realize that there's a huge opportunity in Colombia as well in the agribusiness sector. Of course, we have to compete with Brazil, we have to compete with Mexico. But you know, when you speak about food security, and even more in the GCC, which is basically an importer 
block or a hub for distribution to some other areas, as, as you could have most suppliers and trustable suppliers, I think it's over the, the table. And I have to say, uh, without hesitation, that in the case of Colombia, the rule of law, the condition of our economy, the conditions of our long-term policies uh, will make sure that not only a strategic relationship with the ECC in terms of foreign policy, but in terms of how we attract FDI into this country is something that we have on our hands to compete to our partners in Latin America. Well, thank you for that very honest and very direct uh, response. A um, uh, question uh, comes up in regards to um, uh, what is the best uh, way of approaching investment opportunities? What is the decision-making process? I think I will give this uh, to Amaury uh, from his experience in the Middle East uh, through vision investments. How has your experience been in trying to attract the GCC investors into Brazil? If you can elaborate on what are the tendencies of our region? Sure, sure. Um, I've been going to the region since 2007, so it's about 13 years now, um, and have investors from the region. And what I think it's uh, fundamental uh, from the perspective of a sort of an investor, it's a balance between sort of like a legal framework. So uh, make sure that there is a legal stable framework where they invest. Uh, and the payoff, of course, there's sort of like a, an attractive, I'll say, uh, payout from the investment, uh, which is uh, fundamental. And more than anything else is uh, the trust and relationship that develops with the fiduciary in the country. So um, it's, it's uh, uh, as, as pointed out, I think we even pointed out, I think uh, you have to understand the culture and you have to understand when you move to a different country, all the procedures and all the things that are sometimes easier or more difficult than your own uh, sort of like country. And uh, in that, that particular case, uh, we have always, since we are basically uh, a fiduciary for foreign investors in Brazil, uh, our goal is really always to facilitate that sort of like uh, exchange of uh, cultural mismatches that you have in any investment procedure. Right? Uh, over time, I mean, for instance, uh, I have developed uh, like a large project with like a sovereign uh, in the UAE that was focused, for instance, in integrating uh, all the logistic chain uh, in regards to food production into export directly uh, without intermediaries to to, uh, to the GCC. Uh, so th that was an interesting project. Uh, it was a, like a very large project that in, in the end, uh, at the time, food security uh, around 2012, 2013, uh, didn't become any longer like a major issue. Uh, we had that issue going from 2009 and 2011, and then it kind of faded down a little bit. But this was a very interesting learning process because we worked almost a year and a half on developing uh, that uh, procedure and that project, which was basically to do a direct link of food production into exporting and processing in the Middle East. So I think that um, uh, more than anything else, uh, what the investor wants to make sure is that you have a very strong uh, legal regulatory framework that they can rely on to make sure that uh, when they invest, nothing will happen forward that will sort of like damage the investment procedure. And even uh, in a situation in Brazil, Brazil has changed in 2010 uh, the issue of ownership, uh, but uh, there's always an, a, a sort of like what's called grandfathering. grandfathering. So uh, investors, foreign investors that have been in Brazil that have lands, they never had any problem to continue to hold their lands because uh, any law changes, it preserves the, the uh, sort of the, the uh, uh, the rights that they have at the time that they, they have invested. So I think that uh, fundamentally, I think that uh, legal, strong legal regulatory framework, it's sort of uh, the most important, I would say, basis for an investor coming to a country. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, for my Mexican counterpart, I would like to ask you the two strategies you have. For example, we've been discussing a lot uh, kind of the investment into uh, Latin American countries to bring back the product into the GCC. <clears throat> but I'm sure I know for a fact that Mexico has opportunities, for example, in blueberry production that doesn't have to be necessarily sold to the Arab world, but can be sold to the United States and other uh, countries. Do you have also this strategy to attract uh, foreign direct investment from the Arab world, or is it just related to the, the investment and exportation back into the GCC. 
Yes. Okay. We know that the food supply changes. There are the climate change, the structural factors influencing rising and volatile prices, the population growth, the urbanization, and the food policies, as we mentioned. But the big challenge for resilience of supply chains is the diversification. So in Mexico, we have to diversify, diversify, diversify our markets, not only United States, we have Europe, Asia, as I mentioned, but we have to develop the Middle East market because you need products. We, we are one of the most important countries in, in uh, fruit and vegetable production. So we have to improve our international trade and logistics. And um, that is, that is the, 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 the big challenge that, that we have. And we are doing our, our best to improve our standards and certification of uh, quality. And uh, the, the diversification is, is one of the, 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 the key answers for, for, for that, Abdallah. Uh, sorry, I'm going to, um, if I may, um, and what is the strategy uh, for diversification for foreign investment, if there is? Yes, we need to, to improve our infrastructure. I repeat a, a lot about the infrastructure. We, need, we have the production on fields, on, on countryside, and the strategy is diversify the products and improve the quality of our products, add value, and also improve the certification for the Middle East. We, we opened the halal certification five years ago. And five years ago, Mexico export around $50 million, almost nothing. And after that, after open that certification and improve and promote the, the export to Middle East, increase in almost $250 million a year. So we are in the right route, but we have to promote and show how Mexico is increasing and how it's doing uh, our best to, to give you the best products from Mexico. But also we need how requirements, what requirements do you need also of the demand markets and to build a compliance system to get the link between the demands and the, and, and the offer from Mexico to the Middle East. Uh, thank you very much. I just forgot to mention, I apologize, the name of the person that asked the previous question was Tatiana Cordoba. I have another question for uh, my colleague from Saudi Arabia, which is, in a, uh, I think, I believe a very important question in regards to food security. Uh, the question, and please elaborate, I, th I think you mentioned it briefly, but could you please elaborate? The question is from Iwan Budiarta. I apologize if I pronounce that wrong, is what kind of sector community is the priorities of the GPC investor? Specifically, can you answer for, for your own organization and for Saudi Arabia in detail? Okay, so as I explained before, we, we really are, our DNA is a food security organization. And food security is not about the, the luxury spectrum of food. It's about providing the basics that a diet requires. So we principally have 12 products that we focus on, which, um, and, and I won't cite 12 because I'm going to talk about groups. It's the grains, it's the oil seeds, so it's wheat, barley, it's corn, it's soya, um, it's, it's oils, vegetable oils. Um, it, is, it is red meat, which it is, it is beef, um, it is it is lamb, it is is chicken as a white meat. Fish is very important. Um, also, slightly unusually, is is forage, um, and and then dairy products, but particularly milk powder. Um, so it's it's that type of product. So these are just sugar. These are just the products that are the very basics of a, of a diet. And this is why I kept talking about that we are looking at larger quantities um, and we allow the other more peripheral products the, the 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 more kind of choice products to come on the back of our investment um, i i would also say that this is not just about production 
um, that there are there are elements of uh, looking for opportunities where we are involved in production, but you can't grow all of your food security. But by definition, you know, seasons change, prices change, so you can't put your farms in the right place. And, and if you have a consumption, for example, as we do, of approximately 9 million carcasses of sheep, that, that is about an 18 million flock. That's that's 30% of the Australian flock. So uh, we don't endeavour to be farmers to that extent. We would, and we have invested in production to make sure that we've got access to the whole vertically inter integrated chain. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, it, the world actually trades. That, that's how you move food around. So a, a lot of our investment will be looking at supply chain, processing, added value, um, and, and identifying identifying those parts of the of the food chain that would benefit from our investment. Um, often it might be a, a family that is looking for some sort of succession or it might be an organization that may have acquired rather too much debt and would like to have a more stable uh, equity so that they're working for their investors rather than the bank. Um, so so we, would, we would identify full supply chains all the way back from the classic field to, to back to the kingdom and strategically invest in those areas that would need our support. And it does, if, if I may go on for a moment, it does make our investment a, a slightly more complex type of investment. We're not just focused on return. Return is the way you get to do everything next year and the year after and the year after and, and have a self-repeating, self-sustaining business. That's the definition of, one of the definitions of profit. Um, but this is really is, this really is about long-term profitable, but long-term sustainable food supplies chains. So we really don't see anybody that's just wanting to be connected to Selic for a short-term financial gain. Um, I, I hope that goes some way to answering the question. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That, that's very clear. Uh, I believe we can talk forever on this subject, and I'm more than prepared to. But let me just uh, mention again, uh, I've been a, a long time in Latin America, and I think uh, my colleague from Saudi Arabia will agree, there's a lot of investment opportunities, there's a lot of food security options that we have in Latin America. In my strong opinion, when it comes to infrastructure, uh, we're not going to go into the details of the historic um, uh, kind of concepts that happened in Mexico or Brazil of why they don't have the right infrastructure uh, for the, the food to be exported uh, with a nice cost and, um, and so on and so forth. But uh, again, I repeat, when we come in, uh, as my colleague from Saudi Arabia said, with a huge investment in agriculture, the logistics side is also part of our solution. I can give many examples, but I won't elaborate. So I think the theme uh, today is not that it's challenging, as, as the title suggests, it's just that I think the promotion from both sides, the more meetings from both sides uh, needs to be obtained. Um, during the coronavirus, I think that's a bit tricky, uh, but I think things will go along. Now, uh, in regards to our, our audience, I think our audience is quite also, like us, very uh, ignorant because they're asking the same kind of questions. Uh, my last question to everyone, and I want a quick fire uh, answer is uh, in one or two sentences uh, what do you feel in the next couple of years um, that the both reach oh Astrid just came on she's going to kick us out but let's very quickly just a very quick uh, answer I'll give everyone the floor is what do you think a mechanism um, for each region to to um, to implement will, will create this investment in Latin America I'll start with, of course, again, being biased, I'll start with my colleague from Saudi Arabia. I think the most important thing is comfort. Uh, and I think that that is, uh, as our, our colleague from Colombia said, creating the framework of being able to be confident enough to invest. So that is a regulatory framework that is seeing a government um, 
that 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 has a strategy and delivers it and repeatedly delivers it and doesn't move from left to right. So I think that geopolitical stability is something that is very important. It, it would appear to us that very often those areas of food abundance in the world uh, have also had uh, difficulties in, in a geopolitical sense. Um, and you know, we, we really need that little extra bit of comfort and often the government, the regulatory, uh, the, the food hygiene, all of those those matters, the, the, the import-export barriers. You know, we, we just want a very fair, transparent trading operating environment to give us that incentive to, to, to make that move. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pass it to my Colombian counterpart. Well, Abdallah, as William said, political stability and the rule of law. I think those are critical issues in any country not only for receiving foreign direct investment, but also for promoting itself as a country open for business. And I think that's what Colombia has done for many years, for decades. And we look forward in the next presidential election to continue to do so. Thank you. Uh, my Brazilian counterpart? Sure. I think that the, the bottom line is to look at GDP, GDP growth. I think when you look at GDP growth of agriculture in Brazil, has surpassed by far GDP growth of the country. And even depending on certain subsectors, uh, over the course of 30 years has been about four times the GDP growth of the country. So uh, when you look at that as a measure, it's easy to see that the policies and the infrastructure in terms of support from the government is always there, despite the change of uh, political parties and the change of like, uh, uh, sort of like uh, general, like uh, I would say, uh, uh, political views of the country. And it's interesting because Brazil has been gone from uh, sort of like a more leftist government to a more right government. But uh, the agriculture in Brazil has been booming all over those years and has had uh, more and more over time, uh, I would say, policies and support from a legal regulatory framework that has been stronger over time. So I think that that's sort of the component that I think that uh, clearly gives the path of where we should be heading even in the future. Thank you very much. I will give the floor to my Mexican counterpart, but before I do so, I really believe that uh, our Mexican counterparts should just leave the agriculture industry and concentrate on how to groom beards. I think you'll make a lot of money in the Arab world. But please, uh, give you, I give you the floor. Yes. yes. Uh, we, we, we have two clear things, uh, Mr. Abdallah. We have to optimize the supply chain of the agriculture sector. And to optimize the, the food uh, supply chain, we need to invest in technology. We need to invest in logistic infrastructure as well. And improving direct to consumer uh, commerce as well. And improving resilience of the market system. And also, most important is food safety protocols and standards. And that the best and strongest collaboration and strategic partnerships between all parts. And we see uh, Mexico into a global agrologistic platform and to be among the top five scholars in the world for the next 10 years. So we are working on that route, but we need uh, a partnership, we need investment infrastructure, and we need trust together. Because if we don't trust uh, among the, 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 the countries or the country parts, we need to, to build a strongest and, and, and trusted uh, relationship between the demand and the offer of uh, agricultural products. And Mexico is very good. Well, thank you very much. I think Astrid wants me to get offline. She's staring at me. Uh, I, I really thank the panelists and uh, everyone that joined. Just before I finish, I would like to take uh, to thank His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, the ruler of Dubai, also the Ministry of Economy, and of course, uh, Mr. Walid, who's uh, for many, many years uh, built uh, the annual investment meeting to what it is today. And of course, uh, Astrid and Mr. I don't know how to pronounce his name. I think it's Pramendesh, uh, who's uh, done the entire IT. I, Astrid, please help me with his name. Uh, I really thank the team and thank everyone. Astrid, you can kick us out now. Thank you very much, Abdallah. It's Mr. Prashant 
and the team of conference, conference producers from the annual investment meeting. But actually, all the BDMs from the AIM are right here with us speaking uh, while we're speaking, and they are very attentive of what we, uh, you have to say. Thank you all to our panel of experts for joining us today and taking time from their schedule to share their experience and, and perspective with us. It was uh, quite an enriching session. We're very excited as this was the first session, the annual investment meeting series with Latin America speakers. We had a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much for your presence today. Remember that we're receiving applications for the Agribusiness Virtual Trade Mission until July 31st, 2020 in www.aimcongress.com slash ptm slash register. I would also like to thank our audience for joining us and sharing their questions. The link to today's webinar, video, and presentation will be sent to you via email. We're also conducting a short survey to get you your feedback on today's webinar. The link to the survey will be shared with you via the chat and via email. To register for our next webinar scheduled for July 16, 2020, please visit our website, www.mcongress.com slash webinars. Also, please follow us on social media and our social media channels to keep updated about our activities. Thank you all once again. We look forward to seeing you on July 16th. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening or day. Bye, -bye. thank you very much.